Okay. So, hi, Thomas. Hello. How are you today? I am uh, doing very well. Um, I'm a, I'm I'm very busy, which surprises me because for a while I felt my work was slowing down, and then oh. it started picking up and being faster. And I'm doing a great deal these days. I can't I can't keep up with it all. Oh. Okay, I mean. Maybe perhaps of the COVID situation, everything slowed down a little bit. But um, now maybe the people started to get used and maybe the things uh, start to change. So it's, it's, it's start to be a normality, this situation. Yes. And people start to be more open and more. Um... So a um, few words about Thomas Moore. Thomas Moore, it's a well-known author. Um, he wrote uh, like 24 or 25 books. Uh, I don't know if it's correct, the number. And, uh, but still counting because you have been, you are writing also something now. And um, the most uh, uh, famous book, I would say, it's The Care of the Soul. I mean, it was the uh, in the top of the New York Times uh, bestseller list. Um, some of his books, like Soulmates, Dark Knight of the Soul, um, and the latest, I think, uh, Soul Therapy. Um, at least in these books, we find the same soul, soul, soul. So <laughs> what is soul for you? And uh, I think you, you, you get this question quite often because for me, soul, when I heard this word soul, it's always had some religious undertone. And uh, I would like to, to see your, uh, your perspective. Um, it's it's always difficult to talk about soul because it's a word that uh, can't be defined too well. It's a little bit like saying, can you define yourself or can you define life? It's so, so basic like that. It's, it's easy to talk about, but it's very difficult to, to be very specific and define it. But I can say that I feel some things about soul. I think that the, the reason I use that word so much is that uh, I'm interested in old uh, writings, ancient writings, and the word is used very often in ancient writings. Um, the word in Greek is uh, psyche, or it means uh, uh, would be our word in psychology. It's the same word or psychotherapy. So the psyche or psyche, psyche is 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 uh, is there in those words. It's hidden, but it's there. So even, soul is even in psychotherapy when we talk about it, and it's in yeah. psychology. So um, I think it has to do with our depth. We go when you go deep into yourself. It's not it's not a terribly superficial thing, although you can talk about the soul in your daily life. It's still it has a lot to do with your depth, if, and also uh, your height. You're going up because I think I think that the tradition is that when you talk about soul, you must at the same time talk about spirit. So spirituality it doesn't have to mean religion in the in the way you people usually think of it it's more like uh, i would define religion as a relationship to the mysteries in life and more about being mystical an ordinary person being mystical like being mystical in nature or with art listening to music or you know, just being quiet that can be mystical without having to be part of any religion. So in that sense, soul uh, also 
invites us to talk about the spirit. So it, even though it sounds like a religious word sometimes, it really is not about religion so much as a higher dimension. There's a higher dimension to it. So actually what you are saying that you cannot make really a difference between soul and spirit. I mean, sometimes maybe it's more like soulful or sometimes maybe a more spirit there, but they are always together in some sense. They're always together. I don't think you can have one without the other to some extent. I don't mean mm -hmm. they have to be equal and in balance. I don't mean that because mm -hmm. sometimes you, some experiences I think are more of the soul. For example, uh, your home, of, of taking care of your home and making it the way you like it and feeling comfortable and having mm -hmm. people over and feeling good about that and making dinner and cooking and all those things are full of soul. I think that's pretty clear for most people. And the spiritual side is there, but it's it's small in comparison, I think. You can find it in home, certainly, but generally it's not so much, but it's going to be there. And other experiences like, uh, let's say you practice some form of meditation or, or yoga or some, uh, you know, like Tai Chi, some kind of uh, physical thing. It's probably going to be more spiritual, have more spirit in it than the soul. But still, there will also be that soul side to it. And so they do go together. And I don't think you can have one without the other, or you shouldn't. If you do have, let's say, a spiritual practice and don't have any soul in it, it's, it's going to be not very effective or it could be dangerous to you. So you need you need both soul and spirit in everything you do. Um, it's interesting you mentioned meditation because uh, yeah, my first uh, experience with meditation, I think it was a very spiritual, at least how I understand it at the beginning. It was, was a very spiritual uh, uh, practice. I mean, I wanted to attain some very, uh, very high level of uh, consciousness, state of consciousness. But today, after doing some work with you, I see it very differently, very, very differently. It's more some something, it's more like um, making room for every experience, um, love every experience, even though it's unpleasant. And um, to be conscious about them, maybe there it's a little bit of spirit. Yes. But, uh, it, it's and, and sometimes I'm wondering because in 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 the in the uh, old Greek and you know a lot of about uh, mythology and uh, and uh, in um, for example in Plotin work a lot of time they work about contemplation. And which for me it's quite close to meditation, but I think it's more soulful practice than uh, than the classical way of meditation. Because sometimes people understand that they have to get rid of something to attain a higher level of consciousness. Yes, I've been I've been interested most of my life. In, in a kind of spirituality that is not separate from ordinary life and from the world in which we live. I get a lot of that from, I don't know if, if uh, you uh, know as much about uh, um, Henry David Thoreau in, uh, in the United States in the 19th century. He Just wrote, from your course, yeah. Oh yeah, he wrote, he yeah. was a writer well known here in the United States because and, and he lived not far from where I live. He lived just about an hour's drive from here. And uh, he wrote some beautiful books. And I read his diaries, his journals all the time. And his idea was that, and he, he spent most of his life in a canoe. He was in the rivers and he would, but then he would write about his experiences. And he had this idea that 
that his ordinary experience is like being on the river and getting to know the birds and other animals in his area was part of his spirituality, part of his spiritual practice. He felt that if you're going to be in nature, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't think of nature abstractly, but it should be the trees where you live, like get to know the trees where you live, get to know the animals around you. So that it, and that's very soulful to be, to be local and intimate with nature rather than cosmic in nature. There's a place for the cosmic, but I like Thoreau's idea of being intimate and individual with nature. And I think that brings soul and spirit together pretty well. Beautiful, beautiful. Now it, it came, came to my mind the image of um, from uh, Hermann Hesse's book, Siddhartha, when the Siddhartha stays at the river and uh, the river started to talk with him. And it's, and he realized he doesn't have to look anywhere. Is there everything what, what he needs in the... That's yeah. right. I remember that. That's, that's at the end of the book, isn't it? At the end the, of the book, yes, end. yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So One of he, my favorite books, yeah. And, and he has tried many other things. Yes. And, many. Yeah, and this is my question. Uh, uh, it is one of my questions, actually, that um, you need to go through different kind of things in life. I mean, if we say in the Jungian terms that you have a, a persona or to build up your persona first, to find after your animal or your deepness in, in, in yourself. I, I, this is, it's, my, it's, it's a question I, I don't know the answer. If I, I will look back at my life, it would be very difficult in my twenties, even though I, I started to look, to read like Jung and, um, and Taoism and this kind of stuff, but my understanding was very, very different from where I, I am now. So I don't know, you need all these things or or you just can have an insight and and even if you are a young at young age and I think I think there's a little bit of both. I know in my experience, I certainly had to go step by step. Uh, I remember when I first uh, went to do my studies, my doctoral studies in in religious studies. Um, I was very interested in humanistic psychology and Abraham Maslow and uh, all those people around him, transpersonal psychology and all mm -hmm. of that. And then in my first course at the university, I studied Jung and was, was told to read the collective works of Jung, his 18 volumes of writings. And that changed me. I, I no longer was interested in Maslow and uh, the humanistic psychologist. I didn't do what I thought I would do in that uh, program. So that's one example, a small example of how, uh, although I, I have changed, you know, gone from step to step in my life. And yet I look back and I see a very, very strong, uh, what's the word, uh, a strong path it all makes great deal of sense. And so in another way, it wasn't really deviating. It wasn't going away from that, but but it hadn't been fulfilled. It hadn't been opened up enough yet. So in my earlier years, I really didn't know where I was heading, but I was on the right track. Yeah. I think I think it's 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 a uh, uh, it was the same in my case too. We needed that experiences, and we were there, like so somebody take care to be in the right yes. uh, path. I think so. I st I studied uh, early on before I discovered Jung. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I studied uh, Carl Rogers and. Uh, uh, that approach to therapy where you are very, very sensitive to your client 
and and it's called client centered therapy and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so i'm very happy that i had that experience of going through that to learn carl rogers i think it gave something to me for my future work mm -hmm. but then i was happy to move away from it and move toward what i think is a deeper approach with with jung and then uh, james hillman and others I think yes, Carol. Just it's it, it's important, especially in client uh, therapist relation, how you relate to the client, and uh, so give you some even practical uh, um, tools to to work. Yes, I think so. Um, I forgot to mention, but uh, Thomas Moore was a. Uh, uh, for, he's a former monk he yeah so he has a very intimate relationship with religion and um, he has a phd in religious studies yeah. and you are you were also university professor and you teach religion no yes yeah. i'm curious about your experiences regarding this because yeah um how you see religion you are somebody from inside, and I would be interested in, in your perspective, if it's okay. Yes, of course. I started out in an Irish Catholic, uh, Irish American Catholic family. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Irish are, were at that time very, very Catholic, you know, very, very much so. And that's the where I grew up. So I grew up in a very religious uh, Roman Catholic uh, devout setting, and I went to a Catholic school in my, you know, the, uh, first my first years of school, and I I served uh, with the the rituals and the liturgy, the mass. I so I got to know the priests very well, and their life. I could see it, and it attracted me. And when I was thirteen, I left home at thirteen to join this to study to be a priest. It would, it would have been a 13 year program of study. Very long time. Long. I had yeah. to leave home to do that. Mm -hmm. It was difficult because I had a very, very wonderful family and to leave was very difficult. I think I was homesick all the time I was away. Oh. And, but I, but, but I, I grew up in a family of plumbers and and, and I love trades, you know, I, I love the trade people and I feel very, very close to people who do trades like electricity or mm -hmm. uh, plumbing, uh, carpentry. But um, but I think that, that joining this, you know, going away, leaving home opened up, put me in a much bigger world. My family yeah. had a kind of a small world. They were beautiful mm -hmm. people, but a smaller world. I got into this big world. And um, so my ideas about religion changed gradually uh, over time. And I would say when I, uh, I studied uh, religion, my studies of the gospels were very technical and very open-minded. And uh, and my study of theology was very interesting. It was very intelligent and open. So even though I was a Catholic monk, I was reading Paul Tillich, who was a wonderful existentialist mm -hmm. theologian. And, uh, and so by the time I got to study religion at, in my doctoral studies, I had a whole different idea what religion was. It was no longer these institutions. It was anything at all that would bring us in touch with uh, the mysteries of life or uh, those openings in understanding that don't have any answers. And um, so uh, the program I was in taught uh, literature like like fiction and poetry, not the Bible. You know, it was beautiful. 
when I when I asked them, I had to pass. I had to give uh, take an exam in what they call biblical texts, mm -hmm. and I asked them if I could use Greek tragedy as my biblical text, and they said, "Of course, yes." <laughs> so that's what I mean. I had a very open, very broad, and I think very intelligent approach to these things. So when I uh, my what I bring my my religious background that I bring is an interest in asking the questions the deep questions about things, and not having answers. And and not having a system or an institution, but uh, uh, it's hardly religion the way people know it, but it is asking the deepest questions. And so, so that's where I am. That's what, when I, my background is in religion, but it has this very broad definition. Yes, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I think usually we get in touch first with the institution and some, some people already stops there because it's difficult to see uh, uh, more deeply in, uh, And um, another question I would like to ask you: You have um, uh, you are you you are talking in your books and about soul psychology and how is different than other psychologies because we have today we talks about a lot of kind of psychology. So yeah, uh, well, it's funny to use the word soul psychology since psychology has soul in the word. Yeah, soul yes. Psychology. But, uh, but I think the difference is that uh, a number of things that when we focus on soul in our psychology, we are not talking about mind. Some mm -hmm. people think of psychology as about mm -hmm. the mind. It's not about that. It's uh, much more mysterious and more difficult to pin down, and you can't have simple solutions. There are no simple solutions uh, in this psychology. You have to go deep, as deep as possible. You use images and narrative, uh, various kinds of story are really, they are the most important thing. Not diagnoses, you know, not diagnoses so much and not, uh, not looking for understanding and trying to figure somebody out as a way to be healthier. We don't do that in the soul psychology. We're interested in more in soul psychology and helping a person live a more soulful life. That means living their own individual life and not, not being so affected by the culture. Yeah, you're going to be affected, but to be able to find your individuality, of course, that's Jung's idea of individuation. Mm -hmm. And um, and also uh, to understand that you are a mystery, that you will never be, you'll never understand yourself or anybody else completely. There's no way to do that. And so our approach is not to make all these studies and quantified studies that doesn't make any sense there are no quantified studies in soul work it's a different thing it's more image and narrative and and as I, we've already said it also includes a spiritual dimension about meaning and where do you find meaning and and you know like your sources my sources are largely very often from religious texts, you know, like the mystics, even of Christianity or Judaism or Islam. Those mystics, I'm very interested in learning from them. Uh, that's part of the soul. And uh, I think finally, I would say that uh, that a soul psychology, it's a little, this is difficult, but I'll say it, I'll try to say it. You discover in your soul psychology that you are you are many persons, you're not just one. That you have many identities in a way, and there are many powers of life living, like flowing through you, like 
you will have your own experience of love in your life. Love is a basic human experience, but you will have it in your own way. And it's not your, it's not only yours because it's a basic human experience, but it's a power of life. Like love has great power and it comes through you and you try to find some way to make love part of your life. And that becomes a big part of soul therapy then. So many people are trying to find love. And so that's one of those powers. You might also, some people are trying to find creativity, a way to express themselves creatively and to do work that is creative. And so that's another power that's for quite different. It's not the same as love. And it's basically human, but you have to find it in your own way for yourself. And so that's what we do in the soul therapy. We're interested in these larger powers that are human that we want to um, adapt to our own self and to our own life in our own way. Uh, maybe these powers are universal powers. They are in universe and just they are uh, flowing through us or they are manifesting through us. Or, and, but I think it's, it's, it's something more and more deep and it's you, but not you. It's, it's something, uh, I don't know maybe this is already too, too spiritual, but this is how I see it. For me, it was actually how I understand a little bit this. It was about, uh, it's a story about Michelangelo who said that um, he, the, the sculpture, the statue, it's in the, in the marvel. It's not in his mind or in his hand or not. It's, it's there and just he will free it up. So I think this is very deep and um, didn't think he's a he's the genius. I mean, his ego, but it's something outside, and he's talking to him. Yeah. So, in his sense, then the ego has a role. I, you have a role. Mm -hmm. Your role is to is first of all to respect that the the image is is there in the marble. You, you don't create it you, you you don't you don't make it up it's there but you have to discover it and so your creativity and your skill are very important in finding it but it's not something you create so i have trouble when i hear authors say a fiction say well i created this character in my story i th that i don't think that's right you don't create the character, you discover the, or you, you meet the, the character. <laughs> and I think if you have a long life in general, you will start to see these characters, they, they repeat themselves somehow in movies, in, in stories. In, yes. You start to see the mythology, which is far beyond the story the meat that's right and this can be an insight even if you are not interested in i don't know in mythology or psychology but you'll start to see that there are patterns there in in in, in the movies in in life yes. and they are not so different than we think no and those characters might appear in many places like right now i am i just finished writing up a course that i'm giving on fairy tales Oh. for another organization. And mm -hmm. uh, I had to write uh, 12, new, uh, 12 emails long, like 1500 words each on, oh. a, on a fairy tale. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, you see characters in fairy tales, I think that are also part of life. So it doesn't make too much difference which uh, kind of, of writing you go to it, you can go to a many different forms um, and some of i have a new book i just turning in now on emptiness on the idea of emptiness and stories about emptiness and 
One of the stories is just a joke people tell. It's a joke I found in a book of jokes. So they, you can find these characters in any kind of narrative, any kind of story. The fairy tales, mythology, novels, poetry, you, uh, theater, Even movies. movies yeah. you See, I thought, yeah. But I think this idea that you find that you have many characters in yourself as well. And maybe you don't identify with all of them as much as you identify with what you call I, but they are there. There are many characters that may come through. So um, at different times, you may embody some other character as well as the I. And this is the big part of a soul psychology to be able to not to have to, it's not an ego psychology. It's not all about the ego. I think the world needs this kind of psychology because a lot of today, not everything, but a lot of things about, it's about ego yes. and how to strengthen the ego. Yes. Which I don't know if it's not, uh, not a self-defeating movement sometimes not all the time but sometimes you just make more uh, inflexibility with this um, approach yes i think what you are talking about is the psychological um, polytheism there Hillman's idea about this and in your work also this is a very important uh, uh, perspective yes I was just avoiding the words so that I wouldn't have the complexity. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't. No, you know, no, it's, no, it's fine. It's, it's fine. It, it, I had a strange experience with this because um, I, it was a, 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 a webinar about him I'm here in Romania recently, the first one actually. And um, of course, I have a lot of information. So for me, I was curious, but it wasn't very deep, at least from my perspective. And I started to, to uh, um, put question about this idea of polytheism. And I, I saw a lot of, uh, how should I say, um, um, maybe, I don't know the right word, but um, cautiousness. They, somehow they avoid it, this idea. Uh, and for me, this is a revolutionary in human's work. And I think it's a main idea in his work. And uh, of course, in your works too, because uh, you were a very close uh, uh, friend of James Hillman. And, uh, you did also work together, workshops, if I know well. Yes. So I think this is a very important um, uh, idea. Of course, it's going against the main um, main path paths of psychology today, but still, it, it, I think it's very important. Yes, I, I think so too. It's uh, it's one of the key, maybe one of key five or six key ideas of James Hillman. One of those would be polytheism. Uh, it's hard for people to grasp at first. It takes a while to get off for many people to 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 appreciate that idea. But once you get it, it's hard to go away from it. Then you know, it's hard to exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I, I'm curious about emptiness. How you see emptiness? This, this idea. This idea is from Buddhism, and I know it's it's quite uh, close to you. This was a nice surprise for me that when I started your uh, course, your um, yeah, and it was there. I was a little bit surprised, but in a pleasant way. <laughs> Yes. Well, you know that I have a background, and we talked about a background in yeah. religion. It's not just Christianity. I've 
Yeah, it's right. a few others, especially Buddhism mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, Zen Buddhism in particular. Mm -hmm. So that, that idea of emptiness or what they call shunyata really has has uh, affected me a great deal. What it means for me is that uh, anything like today, our conversation, I don't really feel that anything I'm saying is literal. It's not, I'm trying, not trying to say this is what is. I'm trying to say, let's find some language that will get us, move us along toward deeper understanding of ourselves and our world. And I don't need to use any particular language. I could give up the word soul and I would be fine. It's not easy for me because all my books <laughs> have gone in that direction. But I could do it if I needed to because it's empty. Empty in the sense that it's not that it's vacant and doesn't mean anything, but that I'm not, it's not essential and I'm not attached to it. I don't need it. Uh, it's useful for the moment, but I don't need to have it. It's, there's nothing there. It's really, it's nothing. It's, it's a useful word for, to use in circumstances, but it's not the only way of talking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like you said, in a certain context, but from a Buddhist perspective, everything appears in a, in a context. And actually, this is somehow the emptiness because they, the things doesn't, the, uh, they don't have a, a ultimate uh, existence. But if you will take it literally, it's like they are absolute. Or they are. Uh... That's right. So this I, is, yeah, yes. I, uh, uh, I, I, but the thought escaped me there. I was thinking that, uh, you know, with Buddhism, uh, I've been very interested in Zen for many years. I have many, I have many friends who are Zen Buddhists, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I've read a great deal of Zen Buddhism, and I've attended, you know, a bit, not not a lot, but some practices. And um, uh, I, but that kind of Buddhism that I appreciate is the kind that is not speculative. That's a word that could be used. It's not philosophical so much as it is practical. And so I don't really, I get kind of, I have to say, I'm kind of bored with much Buddhist writing because it is so abstract and so philosophical. And it doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't take me very well. Although I learn, I learn some things, but I prefer to think of emptiness in these ordinary daily situations than to make uh, philosophical statements about the nature of things, the way things are. Ah, okay. I understand. Because this will be an absolute also. It will be a, this kind of statement. And then if you talk about emptiness as the ultimate fact, then you lose the essence of emptiness. Right. You do. It's like it's it's moving and it's there in life and you can you can see this is empty, this thing you're working with is empty. But when you stand back and talk about emptiness, suddenly you lose, you lose something in the process. Yes. Yes. Yes, in, in Buddhism, yeah, it's a lot of philosophy about this emptiness and uh, they, it's a lot of books about this. Yes, and I... yeah, it, yeah, after a while, it's maybe, it's a little bit too much, yeah. I think another interesting aspect of it, uh, uh, Stefan, is that uh, it, it relates, I think, to Hillman's ideas. Uh, you know, he had a, quite a following among uh, Japanese Buddhists and, and Zen Buddhists in particular. Uh, they would often come, these, uh, Jap these uh, Zen Buddhists would come to visit him to, to have conversations with him. And I think the reason was is that he felt that that you can you cannot have an experience of anything except through a, a, an image of some kind, 
you, you're always seeing, you're always looking through an image. You never find the thing itself. You never find the thing, the uh, ding on zig, they call it, you know, the thing itself. You don't, you don't find that. Uh, rather, you're always looking through the, the, uh, uh, the filter of, of an image. And that's what archetypal means, essentially, is that you're looking through a filter of an image at everything. We are never free of some kind of filter, some, some image or story or uh, uh, personality or something that we're looking through. And that's what Hillman thought was the essence of, uh, of his psychology. And that's, I think, why the the Buddhists were interested, the Zen Buddhists were interested because there's nothing there then, you know, there's nothing there in itself. You're always only seeing through the image. And that's very close to a certain understanding of the philosopher Plato, that it would, the image is, is the idos, the image is there. Yeah. Uh it's a book about uh, the uh, Evans, maybe his name, I don't know if yeah. I remember well, which yeah. make a parallel between Zen and uh, Hillman's work. Oh, I and it's, I've never read that. You never read that, yeah. It's an interesting one. I, now I have a lapsus, I don't know the title, but, uh, but it's an interesting. And what he says is that Hillman has some parallel ideas. He didn't study Buddhism, at last not on a deeper level, but his ideas somehow are very close to, to Zen, especially Zen ideas. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting book. Maybe this is the reason why, because for him, the ego was just an image between many others. So I think this is for a Buddhist would be something that he will resonate or will be interested in. So, yeah. Yes, Hellman so, referred once to, to the ego as a complex. It's mm -hmm. one of the complexes that we have. It's an ego. Mm -hmm. And that, that's mm -hmm. putting it, that's making it quite relative. Then it's not literally the center of your being. Mm -hmm. It is one of your complexes, one of the, one of the, uh, um something one of the things that make up who you are but it's all relative then it's not really literally the mm -hmm. center of it all mm -hmm. i think why we think it's a center because it's a lot of emotion around it and then it seems very central but it's just something an image well that reminds me you know i don't know if you know this hillman spoke against the very idea of a center. He mm. didn't like the word center at all. He never, he didn't like that. And he, he'd say, why are all these places you go to study? Why are they called the center for psychological oh, okay. studies or something? It's not the center. That's not what we're looking, or it's not, he didn't, he didn't want to talk about the core, like your core, the core mm -hmm. of you, you know, like the, mm -hmm. the very mm -hmm. center of you. He didn't like mm -hmm. those words because he wanted it all to be more uh, multiple and the no center. Yeah. Does that Multiplicity. Make mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. But this idea, they are also in, in uh, Jung's work, even though he has some kind of idea about the center, the self. But um, uh, for example, he talks about a lot of complex, complexes, not just one. So this is, and he said that they have a certain autonomy. So. Yes, yes, Jung was very, very, and he, he wrote about that a great deal. He wrote, he, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can find, I mean, hundreds of pages in Jung on the complex and, mm -hmm. uh, and talking about them sometimes as the little people. Little uh, people, yes, yes, that's the word. That you are. And, yeah sometimes as uh, the complex as uh, always as multiple always as many many mm -hmm. complexes and and, mm -hmm. and positively he didn't just speak about them negatively he also no 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 I, uh, yes 
he he thought that every complex has a value. Uh, they give you something. Maybe this word even they give you for who that, but they have a value, yes. And you can learn from them and you can be more complex <laughs> through your complexes. Right. So, yeah, I think this idea of itself, it's more, I read somewhere in, um, and maybe this, yes, this idea, it's, it's um, from him actually, that he was very interested about Hinduism. And this self, it's kind of an Atman thing. This was how he got this idea of self. Uh, I see. So, yeah. It makes sense. Uh, he was very impressed. He was very impressed whenever he traveled. You know, he, when, when he, he traveled to India and he was very uh, affected by his travels to India. So I, that makes sense to me. He also traveled to the uh, southwestern United States and visited the Pueblo people there. And that had a big impact on him. He writes about it. That's very yeah. important. Yes, yes. He visited, yeah, he was, uh, he had, um, he, he was interested in this kind of um, old way of life and uh, I don't know the right word because I don't want to say primitive because this is some, he has a- Oh, you can't use that word, no. <laughs> no, no, archaic maybe. Yeah. Archaic way of life. Yeah. And um, also he was in Africa, if I remember yes, right. Yes, Africa too, yes. Yeah, yes. So, yeah. He he saw something very different than our uh, than our um, Western thinking and Western culture. Hillman Hillman too traveled to uh, to India. You know, he spent a year and a half or so oh, in India. I didn't know this. Yes, no. and he wrote a book with an Indian teacher there. It was on Kundalini. Huh. Uh, and so he was influenced as well by what he found there in India. And mm -hmm. you know, that's a polytheistic environment. And I think that that probably had something to do with his development of polytheism. Ah, oh, okay. I didn't know that this. I, for me, his background uh, regarding Eastern religion, it's not very clear. Uh, even I, I, I have some readings like um, uh, revisioning and uh, your book, Blue Fire. I mean, your book together. And um, but uh, for me, it was not clear the relationship between Eastern philosophy and uh, himself. No. No, it's not. It's not so clear. It's funny. I've never understood either. And and I I had. I don't know how many conversations with him over the years, and he never really talked much about India. He didn't talk about going there yeah. and the impact it had on him, and which is surprising. You might think that that would be something he would talk about. Somehow, my uh, how I see it that uh, he wanted to to put emphasis on on Western tradition yeah. especially in western polytheistic tradition like like uh, especially like the greek uh, uh gods and goddesses yes so right. i think this was his emphasis emphasize and uh, and he wanted to stay in this kind of uh yes. um, i don't know limits if i can say or this was his fo focus because i think he thought that this is our uh, origins well, I think that's true. And uh, the fact is that uh, the Greek tragedies, especially, or the comedies, Aristophanes as well, mm -hmm. um, they are, uh, they, they really are a kind of archetypal psychology. You know, they, they, uh, they, they, you know, you live when you read them, you're living in a polytheistic environment. And it's very real. The, the characters struggle with uh, problems in their life and they re refer they connect their problems to the gods 
uh, one play after another. Aristophanes does it in a humorous way, and and the others, Sophocles and Euripides, and uh, and Aeschylus, they they do it in a very heavy, serious way. So, uh, I, and then not only that, but then in the history of painting and literature after that, many many artists had that same idea that they would use the Greek polytheism mm -hmm. as the basis of their work. So many painters painted those Greek scenes. Mm -hmm. So I think when Hillman picked it up, he was part of that long tradition in the European tradition, especially mm -hmm. of using Greek tragedy, Greek plays, Greek uh, drama as the primary method for gaining insight into human life. Beautiful, yes. We are somehow always in the in a meet our life and what's yeah. happening with okay. us. That's so right. they are very like uh, they are very ancient patterns, and I think the human beings are the same, even though we are in a very technological uh, uh, world today. But still, we are the same people. We're the same like, people. We are the same. Yeah, the same. So, uh, Thomas, let me know when when um, when your time. Um, I, I, if you'd like to go a little further, I have five minutes. Okay, okay. So then, uh, tell us uh, something about your your um, teaching about your course in um, in um, online course, which is a beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful course, and you can learn a lot of things what we talk about, and of course, much more. And if you can share a few ideas about, maybe some people will be interested and maybe yes. they can join. Well, I've been a teacher all my life in all different forms, and I, uh, one of the most satisfying formats I had, I used to teach in the summer to. Uh, I teach psychiatrists and psychotherapists, uh, large numbers, uh, like sometimes 100 to 200 every, you know, uh, for a week. And I did that for 18 years, and I learned a lot about teaching, and I enjoyed it very much. And then that ended, and I wasn't doing the teaching so much. I would go to places to give weekend workshops, but they weren't very satisfying because there's not much you can do in three days, and there's no follow up. There's no, no, there's no, you don't continue. It's not continuous. Mm -hmm. So I tried to think a way that I might be able to do the teaching online because I, I like uh, speaking online. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. Uh, I mean, I miss, I miss being in person with people, but I also like to teach online. I have no difficulty. And so I, I decided to try to break up uh, the things I've written about and the essence, the basics of uh, Jungian and archetypal psychology and break that up into themes. And so what I did, I broke it up into uh, uh, six, six week. Uh, six six week courses and then that way people could take one course like for six weeks and not be committed to a whole year and they could or they could drop out if they're if they're too busy or are ready to take a break and then do another one and that's the way it's turned out and i wanted it to be not like school i didn't want it to look like school at all but just a way to learn where I could be there to support the learning and give a few prompts, like some very short readings. These are not big, long readings. I just give a page, page and a half to read at most. And, uh, but I think they're, but I select them very carefully so that they, I think that together they really do teach. They can, we can learn a lot from them. And then I give a talk uh, on the readings uh, live uh, once a week for those six-week sessions. And in between, people 
talk to each other in a chat style online. Uh, and um, that has been turned out to be very active. People really do get engaged. And um, so it's not perfect that you don't learn everything, but, I, but I've noticed that there's also a therapeutic side to that course, that if people are working through things for themselves, it's not just an academic learning, it's, it's a lived learning. And I like that. It's not, it's not personalized so much as that the, the ideas and the material gets deep inside people and affects them therapeutically, which I like very much. And uh, so these, it takes a year to do the course because we take a three week break between each course to refresh ourselves. It's pretty intense when you're doing that. And it um, is, <laughs> it is intense. <laughs> and, uh, and it's intense for me too. Uh, but we take that we take a break and it seems to work quite well. So I'm very happy with it at the moment. And I, I, I usually, uh, I don't know, we have enough people to keep it going, you know, uh, enough people interested. I think there'll be a lot more people, but it's hard to reach people to let them know what's available. Yeah. But, uh, at any rate, I'm, I'm happy with that course very much. I hope to continue it as long as I can. I hope to, because I'm a big fan. And yes, and uh, I should tell you that I had many insights reading the comments of your uh, your comments and the other classmates or other people who uh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful in this way. Yeah, I think so. And of course, the people who are there, they're really interested and uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, it's a beautiful space yes. where you can, yeah. I don't know why it is, but I've done this kind of thing before in other types of courses. And people say such uninteresting things so often. But this, th these courses that I'm doing, I don't know why it is. I think they're quite substantial, the, the comments mm -hmm. that people make. Yeah, they, they're they're quite. Uh, they come from their own personal experience and about their personal experience, but they mm -hmm. really do take the ideas of the course and try to make them, uh, try yeah. to uh, you know take them in for themselves. Yeah, yeah. So I encourage everybody who would like to to uh, sign up for your course and of course who's interested on this approach of soul psychology. Thank you. So thank you, Thomas, for, for this beautiful talk and the, the dialogue. And, and I hope that um, at least virtually, we can uh, invite you here in Romania for a, for a workshop soon. I would love to do that. So please keep that in mind. And Stefan, it's always a great pleasure to speak with you. And you have such understanding and you go your own direction in many ways. And I like that and appreciate it very much. Thank you.